Welcome to All Out Coach, everyone. My name is Tim Mikhailashvili, and I'm your host. Today, I'm very excited because I'm broadcasting it live for the first time on LinkedIn and across social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook as well. So you'll have a chance to interact with my guests, with your comments, with your questions. My podcast is a show that provides me an opportunity to speak with true experts who do not take themselves too seriously. However, they take ideas seriously, no matter what peaks their expertise may reach. This is my 35th uh, episode of the All Out Coach podcast, and I do my best to try to introduce it in a different way every single time. Sometimes I may run out of ideas, and uh, uh, the one of the people that I would reach for new ideas is my guest today. As soon as I watched his videos uh, describing his book called Unsafe Thinking, and I uh, read the book myself, I realized that my guest was on a mission, on a quest for the ideas that matter. There are people, there are ideas that go global, but not all the ideas that go global really matter to our society. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Jonah Sachs, a philanthropist, a marketing executive, a, an author, a writer, a speaker, a contributor to Harvard Business Review as well, because we will talk about uh, how to make ideas that matter go global. Jonah, hey, welcome. Welcome to All Our Coach. Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. It's, it's truly exciting to uh, get a chance to speak to you today. I'm, f I'm f looking forward to this conversation. And uh, to truly demonstrate to you how excited I am, I want to share with the audience how you ended one of your YouTube videos in which you were describing the book Unsafe Thinking as you were writing it. You had gone over your vivid cases uh, of personal stories, and at the end, you shared your Twitter handle, and you spoke to the audience, and you said, and I'm looking forward to meeting the unsafe thinkers of the world out there. Not just the ones that are familiar to everyone, the celebrities, but also the other ones uh, who may not be as well known, who, uh, who have made a change and a transformation in their life somehow. So I thought to myself, Jonah, what qualifies me as an unsafe thinker? I think I am. I think some of my friends, those who are in the audience may define me as, as such. And then I thought about one episode early on from my career. I was 26 years old. I, this was my first role in the corporate environment. And uh, I was on a team of experts in their fields. And I was given a, an opportunity for the first time to share a presentation with them on a regular, on a, any topic of my choice. And so as I think back now, right, 17 years back, it's still quite you know, striking that I was daring enough to share this book. And I just want to show you this book. It's called The Heretic's Handbook of Quotations. And so in this presentation, every slide was essentially a quote from independent thinkers, from people like Robert Ingersoll, uh, Voltaire, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and you name it, right? So, so I thought, look, I, I, I'm going to contact Jonah and I'm going to try to uh, invite him to be on my, on my show. So I'm so glad that you gave my you know, time available for, to speak to me today and to yeah. all of us who are going to listen. I'm glad so to be first... lumped, in, lumped in with those heretics. So let's, <laughs> uh, let's sit down. Yeah, well, they, they were heretics, but a lot of the quotes were quite funny. They weren't revolutionary. They, they actually were quite uh, beneficial, I think, to society. Um, but the first question I want to... Uh, ask you is what really inspired you to write the book on safe thinking? Yeah, so it was really my own journey and my own struggle with falling into the trap of safe thinking that got me uh, on this journey and, and eventually to writing the book. I, I had been running an advertising studio for about 15 years and, you know, like you, started very early in my career with uh, taking big risks. I had built a social change advertising studio called Free Range Studios and done some of the first viral videos on the internet um, around social change issues like factory farming, uh, human rights, blood diamonds. And because we didn't know what we were doing when we started, we took all these crazy risks. Um, we just sort of flew by the seat of our pants and uh, the company did quite well. And so we were 
kind of getting known for breaking rules that we basically didn't even know existed. And in the early days of the internet, you could kind of do that because no one knew what they were doing. Um, but as we got more and more success and the company grew to about 35 people, um, I started to feel more and more pressure to repeat my past successes. And clients were coming to me saying, do that thing you did before that was so great. And I was just trying to please people in a way and just get back to what always had worked the time before. And when you're doing viral marketing, you know, you throw something out there, you just got to hope and it can crash like a bomb if it doesn't. So there's so much um, pressure to do what you did yesterday. There's so much pressure to repeat your successes and avoid the kind of failures that you had. But when the world is changing really fast, as, as the internet does, as our whole world does, doing what you did yesterday is often just a recipe for disaster. And so as the company grew and I grew, I started to become, think of myself less as a creative person breaking the rules and more as someone who had to write the rules so I could get everyone in my company to follow them and to, to give predictable results. And the more payroll you have, the more you need predictable results. And so I started realizing that I was becoming like a corporate executive who was the opposite of the creative I started out as. And the company was suffering. Like we were making more money and growing, but we were less creative and interesting than we had been before. And it was a real crisis for me, a kind of a midlife crisis of how do you get out of this when every day you go in and you have to somehow perform and yet you also have to innovate. And I began to realize as I talked to people and read about how people get out of this, that we're all in the same conundrum, right? As the world changes, we know we need to change. But every day we wake up and we have to go do what we did yesterday. How do you get out of that cycle? And I really had no idea. So I, I basically wrote a book about my own journey to figure that out. Uh, but it wasn't just about me. It was about the people in the world who I admired who had done just that. What are uh, some of the ideas that matter to you today? Well, now I've moved over from, from marketing into philanthropy um, and to social ventures. And, um, you know, I'm very concerned as a, as a, as a father and um, I, I'm very concerned about the state of the climate and state of the world in terms of uh, the ecological crisis that we now face. And my whole career, I have been trying to get people to understand the impacts of the modern lifestyle that we have. One of my first early successes was called The Story of Stuff. It tells the story of where... Uh, all our stuff comes from and where it goes when you throw it away. And it was kind of a 20 minute lecture about the materials economy. And it went extremely viral because people really cared to know what was kind of hidden behind their everyday products. And I've basically been thinking about how do you get people to change their attitudes towards how we interact with natural resources and nature ever since. Um, but the stories are becoming more and more urgent in our, in our short life, in my short lifetime, uh, that it's not about a future event anymore, but about what can we do right now um, to make the changes we need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in, in science also, since, as you know, I work in the pharmaceutical industry for many years, uh, I often uh, wonder, you know, the, about what are some of the targets of our research? I know we have lots of rare diseases. We have lots of vaccines now that we've come up with for, for you know, our entire civilization uh, that are so critical. But then I think we need to continuously ask ourselves, are we researching what we need to research? You know, sometimes I look at children, for example, and I see eternity in their eyes, right? And that, you know, I, I see, I would love to see the next generation live past 100 years, for example, and work on tel telomerase research. And, and those are some of the interests that I, uh, you know, I have scientifically. And I, I would love to see the right ideas go global or go viral. Uh, if you like it, or viral may not may not be the best word to use now, I guess, uh, with, with the coronavirus. The question I want to ask, getting back to the book on safe thinking, which I hope many of the listeners will read, uh, is do you have to have a clear vision uh, in order uh, to spread ideas that matter? Yes, I think that one of the most important things that you can do before you start talking and before you start sharing and trying to drum up sort of attention is really understand where it is that you're trying to lead people and to paint a picture that is appealing and that people will want to be a part of. I mean, right now we are just inundated with messages that are, you know, quick, not particularly well thought out and, and very negative, you know, and, and stimulate a lot of the negative emotions uh, that we have. And so we're kind of overwhelmed by that. And people are hungry and really looking for uh, possible visions of the future that they want to be part of and, and get involved in. 
one of the scenes from film that I'm most taken by is the scene in the, in the film, The Matrix, when uh, you know Neo is tied up and, and the Agent Smith explains to Neo that the first Matrix, they made a beautiful world that was great, but the humans wouldn't believe it. So they had to make a new Matrix where things were pretty bad. And it really is an archetypal story about how hard it is for people to imagine something better. But when someone comes along and is able to do that, uh, it can be incredibly powerful. My first book, Winning the Story Wars, was really all about if you're going to tell a story, first understand what the moral of the story you're trying to teach. What is that deep human truth you're trying to teach? And then build the story around that, as opposed to go out and you know spout a bunch of unconnected ideas, no one will listen. Or talk about yourself and how great you are, no one cares. But share a deep core truth that humans care about and that the audience can say, oh, I want that. And those ideas will spread. So there's a, quite a bit of formula about how to kind of create new myths for our new society. Uh, that I wrote about in that first book. And I do think mm -hmm. it really does start with having an authentic vision and sharing mm -hmm. it uh, through storytelling as opposed to just sort of lecturing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a story also that captivated me about the expedition to discover the source of the Nile River as well. Yeah. Uh, can you share some of the lessons there that you wanted to convey to your readers? As well. Yeah, I spoke. You know, I spoke to the guy who was the first to navigate the Nile River all the way from the mouth to the source. And you know, I would have probably thought that that was a, um, you know, someone who would have been dead a long time. But he, he's still alive, and he's actually not that old. Uh, it happened, although it had been something that people had sought to do for thousands of years. It hadn't actually been done uh, until a few years ago. And so this guy Cam McClay, who I talked to, he really talked to me about how he was able to keep going in the face of, you know, crocodiles and hippopotamuses attacking him, waterfalls that were 100 feet high that no one knew how he was trying to get up to the top of, um, rebels who were in the field who, who, who tried to kill them, um, and why he kept following this incredibly kind of potentially capricious mission to do something that had been like in human imagination for thousands of years. <clears throat> and from him, I really learned that something about the, the idea of flow, which is that when somebody wants something and they find a way to get that level of challenge attuned just beyond their level of ability, they are able to kind of enter a state where they stop questioning their journey and where they stop questioning, like, is this worth it? Can I do it? Where that doubt fades away. And these guys were expert river navigators. Uh, one of them was an ex was an expert aviator, so they were able to actually make their boats fly at one point, which is pretty wow. incredible. Uh, they, they attached wings to the boat, and they took off, and that's how they got up one of the waterfalls. But in every challenge they reached, it was just reaching beyond whatever they had done before. And though that created like quite a bit of fear and anxiety in them, it wasn't to that point where it went so far where they felt they could no longer do it. It was just one small innovation after the next that got them to the, to, the, to the source of the Nile. And so, yeah, this is one of the ideas that I really came up with about using fear as fuel. There's, an, there's something called the safe thinking cycle, which I kind of described a little bit at the beginning. When we face an unfamiliar environment, <clears throat> we automatically feel anxiety. It's kind of hard-coded into psychology of human beings. Anxiety is the way that we kind of wake up and say, oh, the world is changing, or there's a threat out there, I should do something about it. Now, in nature, we get energy and fuel from that anxiety. It gets us out of bed. It gets us moving. It gets us to act. But in in like in the savanna where we in the African savanna where we first uh, evolved, when we would get that kind of super anxiety, when we would get that attack from the lion, what would happen is we'd get these cortisol levels raising in our bodies. Our our peripheral vision would go down. Our digestion would stop, and we would just have to run. And so that super anxiety that we get. <clears throat> stops all creative thinking. It makes you act like this and it turns it, it tunes out the rest of the world. So you just react to that threat. So here's the main problem. The world changes. We feel anxiety, which gives us what's called cortical arousal, which actually gives us energy, but it quickly okay. flips into full on anxiety in which we do what's most expedient, what gets us to step to the next step as fast as possible. And that is the opposite of creativity. So in reading quite a bit, talking to a number of psychologists about what you do about this, um, I learned that you can't interrupt the anxiety. You can't stop feeling fear in the face of something new. Um, 
And I tell the story of Mahatma Gandhi, who, you know, obviously changed the world by taking enormous risks, but was terrified of speaking in front of crowds and was so afraid he couldn't even practice law in India. But he told himself not to not feel that fear. He knew he couldn't stop feeling the fear. But one day when he was kicked off a train for being a person of color in South, in, uh, South Africa, he told himself that he would never let that fear make his life small again. And that whenever he felt afraid, he would take that as a sign that he was on the edge of something new. And that's really what I'm talking about when I say use fear as fuel. The more you try to press down your fears, the more they grow. But the more you notice those moments of anxiety and say, oh, I'm on the edge of something new here, that's where you can create this unsafe thinking cycle, where you can actually use that cortical arousal as an opportunity to make a change. And it's really just quite simple. Next time you feel afraid, instead of pulling back from it, and finding a way out, lean into it and figure out what is new here that I've not seen before. And that's where your first opportunity for, for innovation and change comes. Yeah, I can tell you that, you know, years ago, I really wouldn't see myself doing lots of videos, being very active, posting on LinkedIn, particularly in the corporate environment that I was, I was, right? So even if I wouldn't define it as fear, there, there was a reason, there was a deliberate purpose to add to the conversation, which was social responsibility to help people stretch themselves and lift others really is why I uh, feel that regardless of how many viewers, how many uh, downloads uh, and whether or not this uh, goes viral right now, I know that the experts that I'm speaking to like yourself uh, and the conversations and the lessons that we learned, such as this one you just shared now, uh, are important and are going to motivate many and inspire them as well. Uh, you know, you mentioned fear as well, and uh, I want to uh, make a quick comment here about Tim Grover, who read, uh, who wrote the book Winning, uh, Michael Jordan's coach, and he distinguishes fear also from doubt, where t fear teaches you how to win, while doubt teaches you what you need to do in order not to lose. And that's why you have to embrace fear and use fear as fuel, like you, you mentioned. So uh, there are many uh, lessons that we, we hear about, and they're contradicting. Some people tell you, look, don't say yes to everything, right? Um, learn how to say no, or don't take no for an answer, right? Uh, look, I'm the kind of person, for example, that is more likely to always say yes, and the, which may be a strength and a weakness as well. Right. Uh, because because I feel like uh, if I can, I want to help somebody because it's an opportunity for me to learn whether or not I uh, can meet the deadline. Uh, I know that I will, you know, go all out like this podcast suggests. Right. So many people in the beginning when I started the All Out Coach podcast, they criticized me. Right. And the family and colleagues. And they, they told me, look, All Out Coach, you know, what, what does it mean really? Right. Is this a side hustle? Right. But I, I correct that. I corrected them then and I correct them right now uh, to say that I, I don't look at anything that I do as a side hustle. Uh, right. I, I think I think that that's the way that you, we need to uh, need to understand the feedback that we get. There, there's always some truth in it, but we need to, to reframe it, to take parts of it, to divide it into its individual compartments, if you will. Right. So the reason why I'm talking about feedback is I would love to ask you what kind of feedback and what kind of lessons have you heard from the people since you, your tour, since you have toured for two years, uh, you know, speaking about the book, Unsafe Thinking, from people around the world. What what kind of feedback have you received and what have you learned also in the process? Yeah, um, well, there's a lot of interesting points in, in, in what you were saying and, and things I, I would respond to. I'll, I'll answer that question first. And if we, if we have time, I'll respond to some of the other things you, you mentioned in there. Sure. Um, the most common response that I get when I talk about how to break out of safe thinking cycles is from people who feel that they are in in environments that are stifling. Basically, yes, I would love to take risks, but my boss or my company or my clients uh, just won't let me. And I, I sort of struggle a little bit with this feedback because on the one hand, it really does get to the very point of the book that I was trying to make, which is that um, it's well understood that creativity is not an individual phenomenon. It's actually uh, very much environmentally uh, 
influenced. If you're in a creative environment, you're far more likely to be creative. And a lot of the book is about how do you actually create teams and companies and environments where other people can be creative, kind of like your uh, your daughter's motto, uh, which is, so tell me again. Uh, you are as big as you make people feel. Yeah, okay, there you go. That's what you That's exactly. Like, basically, like, the big point of the book is, is you know, you are as creative as you make, you're, you're as creative as you can make others uh, blossom in their creativity. So on the one hand, I am glad that people are tuning into the uh, idea that their environment actually really influences their creativity. And um, for many people who are say, I'm just in the most stifling, uncreative environment. Unfortunately, I say, you know, you probably have to get out of that environment if you want to be as creative as you want to be. At the same time, uh, I believe that every single person has an ability to influence their team to be a creative MVP at whatever level they are in the company, whatever power they have, and that the story that we tell ourselves that we would only be creative if other people would let us is, of course, this giant trap. So it's something I didn't really realize this contradiction when I first wrote the book and it comes up again and again and again, which is like, how do I function within a environment or company or team that's not that creative when the whole world stifles creativity? You know, I talk about in the book how teachers say, you know, surveys of teachers say they want to encourage creativity. It's what they want to teach in the classroom. But when asked who their favorite and least favorite kids are, they'll always say their favorite kids are the ones they rate as least creative. So we live in a world where we're constantly being rewarded for being conformist, whether you're on a team or just living in this on this planet. Um, and so we really have to look within for how do we unlock and stop focusing so much on who's allowing or not allowing us to be creative. And, you know, you flash an idea on the screen about being an explorer, not an expert. And that's kind of one of the key key lessons that I've really had, which is uh, looked at a study of 20,000 experts uh, done by Philip Tetlock at Berkeley, where uh, he tried to see how well experts could predict the future. And he found that experts who made predictions were worse than dart throwing monkeys, worse than random chance at predicting the future. And the people who were really the worst were the ones who considered themselves to be the greatest experts. So the people who were quoted in the New York Times or on Fox News and who rated themselves as super experts in their field were the least accurate at predicting the future. And what's really going on there is that the more that we believe we are experts and we know, the more we're likely to pattern match and say, oh, I know what, I've been in this situation before, I know what to do, when in fact the situation is different and always changing. And so part of the goal for becoming more creative is to step into situations where you're a beginner and try things that you're terrible at. And the more that you do that, the more that your area of expertise actually will grow. You'll make analogies to new thinking. You'll break your patterns and you'll humble yeah. yourself, which are all ways of becoming more creative. Yeah, uh, you know, I've uh, practically spent most of my life uh, working with scientists, right? Healthcare professionals. But most uh, lately, now that I've started the podcast as well, you know, in my personal time, uh, I've uh, I've realized how important it is to also learn about editing, right? About a lot of the different software, about crossing over different platforms that are more uh, creative types of tasks and skills. But merging creativity with our analytical mindset is something that I'm challenging myself every day, also. And uh, I'm hearing from lots of my guests at all out, you know, at all out coach podcast, Netflix executives. Uh, who uh, who were an expert in one field, but they changed industries, like to your point, you know, and that's what made them stretch themselves to, you know, unprecedented, uh, you know, levels. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you speak uh, to also a, um, a ba Barry Marshall, all right, mm -hmm. Dr. Barry Marshall, who many of my listeners and here and friends at All Out Coach probably know uh, in healthcare. Uh, who came up with the cure for ulcer, right? Yeah. With antibiotics. Yeah. So that was that was also changing conventional norms. And you remind readers about that incident there, yeah, uh, or that episode. Uh, it, yeah, uh, it's such a fascinating story. It, you know, it's kind of an old story, so I hesitated to tell it. But when I, the more I dove into it, the more I was like, this this story has to be told and retold. Um, yeah. So Barry Marshall was a researcher, young researcher uh, in Australia, and he started having an inkling that these ulcer patients that were coming in were actually not, um, might, might be suffering from a bacteria that was causing the ulcer. And um, this was a weird idea because at the time it was believed that stress and smoking were causing ulcers. And that was just the conventional wisdom. Um, 
And he had this, this concept that maybe actually there's, there's a bacterial infection and that it could be cured with antibiotics. And it was so outside of the accepted norms that he could not get any funding for it. He couldn't get any ability to study it. And uh, in fact, without, without the ability to study it, he was not even allowed to prescribe antibiotics and see if it worked on his patients. So after a lot of struggle and really asking the powers that be and begging them because, you know, I think a billion people suffer from ulcers around the world or something like that. Uh, it would make a huge difference in people's lives. Um, and the drug companies, by the way, were really benefiting from kind of treating chronic ulcers uh, when penicillin would be enough to, to cure them potentially. He actually infected himself with the bacteria that he thought was causing the ulcers. And uh, it was, you know, he, he drank a glass of this, you know, soup of bacteria and gave himself uh, a terrible ulcer as well as, you know, just a, a bad bacterial infection. He took the medicine and it, it cured it cured the ulcer condition. He wound up, uh, nobody was still interested except for, I, th I think, the National Enquirer, you know, a, tr a trashy American publication. <laughs> By the time the word spread and spread, he wound up winning the Nobel Prize and changed conventional wisdom about uh, how ulcers are created. He, he found the truth. Uh, but he had to take this enormous personal risk and really do what many might even think was unethical to infect himself with this disease. But he was more, um, he was more loyal to the truth than to the ways of his field. Um, and I, you know, I, I just found my conversation with him to just be so fascinating how he as an individual now is a force for the progression of science in a way, you know, the science is so known for like overcoming the church in the middle ages by asking questions no one wanted to ask, but science itself kind of becomes a church after a while. And you need people like Barry Marshall who, who believe that anything in science should be and can be questioned. Yes. Uh, you know, just, there are two things that, you know, that really popped <laughs> popped right now for me uh, that you mentioned. First, I think the expertise in healthcare, right? Uh, there's, there's studies that I continue to cite when I, uh, you know, design and deliver some educational webinars uh, with my colleagues from 2006 that demonstrate that the years of experience among healthcare professionals does not correlate with quality of care. In fact, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. And and I think that speaks to those conventional norms that we are we, we become so accustomed to. That's also to do with the pattern matching of experts that I said. I've seen this before. Yeah. You know, the new doctor might talk to the patient for 20 minutes to understand what's going on. The old doctor, the experienced doctor may just come in and, and you know, scribble a prescription because they've seen it before when yep. you know, they actually yeah. have it. Yeah, and you mentioned ch the church and, and, and science there, and it just uh, also reminded me of uh, this, uh, this quote, interesting quote by Yuval Harari that I saw on YouTube, by the way, uh, this week. Uh, where uh, he's a historian, of course, for, you know, celebrated historian, probably everyone knows him, uh, pr professor of history. And uh, I, I like this one quote in which he says that history started when people created gods and history will end when people will become gods themselves. Mm. You know, and I think it's a very intriguing quote there that, uh, that probably has so many implications but I mean, we as humans, we need nature. We need, you know, climate, like you mentioned, right? We need to be connected to our uh, environment and we're a, a convivial spe species, right? And, and so I think this pandemic reminded us that, of that, if anything, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I believe. Uh, and so that, that expertise is always important and it needs to be level set because we can't take ourselves too seriously, no matter what peaks of expertise we reach. Right. So Harari, Harari has right. another fantastic quote um, that made a big impression on me. Actually, when I was writing the book, uh -huh. he, the scientific revolution was kicked off when we started being more interested in what we didn't know than what we did know. Um, paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I thought that was fascinating. You know, there was, a, there, was, yeah. there was a feeling before that if it wasn't in the Bible and the priest didn't know, you shouldn't ask. And mm -hmm. then the scientific method really is about leading into our areas of ignorance and being as curious as possible about our areas of ignorance. Uh, and I think that's fascinating. Nobody, there's nobody who knows so much that they shouldn't be on their edge of ignorance. Um, there's no way to know enough. And yet so many people spend the first quarter of their career learning and the last three quarters ossifying, you know, and it's just <laughs> another way.
Yeah, uh, yeah. We have a we have a question from the audience. Should we should we look at that? Oh, we have a question from the audience. Oh, great. So, uh, Kyle Householder. Uh, so, Kyle Kyle asks, what are your thoughts on tactics for convincing the expert that maybe the newbies outsiders' ideas are better? Yeah. Well, there's. Um, I quote a lot of studies in the book. So if you have an expert who cares about sort of like uh, psychological studies and um, organizational design studies, this might be helpful. And this is one of the, one of the ways to look at it. Uh, there, there's something called uh, shared information bias, which is a situation in which teams of people tend to gravitate towards what everyone on the team already knows and agrees upon and actually forget that there are any other ideas. So what happens is two people will come together and usually the, the expert, I mean, the, the leader of the team, the, the insider will speak first and, you know, just kick off the meeting. And what they do is they indicate somewhat subtly, perhaps, what is the shared information that everybody has. They will say what they've been saying because everybody has to listen to the leader and everybody already knows that. But those indications will tell everybody what's in bounds and what's out of bounds in, in a subconscious way. And the studies show that most meetings, people wind up just repeating what everybody came into the meeting knowing. But that's not what you're having a meeting for. <laughs> you're having a meeting to get the information that is not yet shared. That's the whole point. Right. And so there's all these tools that break through shared information bias. So like the leader in a meeting should not speak first. That's just kind of a basic, a basic uh, tool. Mm. You should recognize that the unshared information, the novel information, is usually held by the people with the lowest status in the group. Now, some of that's going to be noise, of course. But if you're looking for a new signal, ask first to, to hear from the people who had who have who speak the least, and you're going to find out what what you're missing or don't know, or a perspective at least that can that can switch the thinking around. Another thing is to do is is ask everybody at the beginning of the meeting before anybody speaks to write down their thoughts on what you're trying to solve, because what happens is we get a kind of amnesia. We actually forget what we came in thinking because we're attuning ourselves to being liked by the group. So as another way of doing it is is making sure that everybody speaks and making sure that everybody shares something that they thought before the meeting began. So these are a couple ways of, of, of recognizing that you shouldn't have meetings at all if you're not looking for that outsider information and that the newbies essentially and the outsiders have that outsider information. And there's a lot of ways of doing of doing this uh, and experimenting with it. And I think that your, your leaders will see immediate results. Now, of course, some leaders don't want those kind of results because they're gonna feel their egos are attacked and they're gonna want to be the only ones to speak in a meeting. There's not that much we can do about that. But um, I do think that those are some 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 tips to, to show a logical reason why the outsider should be speaking a lot more. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Teach me and I forget. Tell me and I remember. Involve me and I learn, right? By yeah. Ben Franklin. It's one of my favorite quotes. And uh, involving others, right? Asking questions. Uh, th thank you, Jonah. Uh, I, I can't uh, leave this conversation without asking you about what role technology uh, plays on our innovation and on our unsafe thinking, ultimately, as we escape reality through technology, which you speak a lot about. So how can we you know, uh, utilize technology in a way to make the ideas that matter actually go global? Yeah, this is a big, this is a big question. Um, and you know, first, you're, I think you're looking a little bit at the whole information overload distraction problem uh, that I talk about in the book quite a bit, which is, you know, that that people who are multitasking and distracted by a number of different inputs all at once um, are going to perform terribly on almost any task. Um, there's a huge, huge amount of data that shows that, you know, when you when you multitask, you don't do anything well. Um, and so uh, we live in a world where we are constantly being pulled out of what we're supposed to be doing by other dings and chimes. And there's a whole business model behind that. This is not just like a random problem. This is what multi, multi hundreds of billions of dollars corporations are turning their AI on us to get us to stop doing what we're trying to do and do what they want us to do. Um, we're, 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 we're in trouble <laughs> in that way. And you know, my, my friend Tristan Harris talks a lot about how like we're playing chess against supercomputers when we are interacting with these social media platforms. Um, so, at the same time, distraction is an important part of creativity because when you're chewing on an idea and focused on an idea, you're going to like focus on your most obvious solutions to it. And it's only when you, lots of people take a hot shower or go for a walk or uh, take a nap 
Thomas Thomas Edison used to you know fall asleep with two balls of metal balls yeah. in his hand, and then when he'd fall asleep, they'd drop on the ground, and he'd wake up, and it was just in that moment of falling asleep that he'd have these huge great ideas. Mm -hmm. So we need the distraction time. Unfortunately, I think that's where technology comes in and cannibalizes us the most. Because right, what happens when there's a, a moment of downtime? You know, you check the scores, you check your Twitter feed, you check your stocks. I mean, you can check anything. Um, but it's that moment when the meeting has ended or you've just exhausted your brain and you need to just go look look into the distance, take a walk, stare at nature. Um, da Vinci used to walk around and just look at sort of like uh, the patterns on the, the wear patterns on the walls of, of buildings. Um, that's what we, that's the time we really need to steal back from technology and that time where there's really nothing going on and your brain is processing in the background all that you've been working on so if you don't if you're always throwing in that podcast or always looking at your phone right. when you have downtime and waiting in line those are your most precious moments to actually make those breakthrough thoughts and ideas so um i think are you I incorporating ask, that into your your everyday as well I'm, I'm always, I'm always fighting, I'm always fighting to do it, right? Because you know, like I think that I, I, I have disconnected from social media almost entirely because I recognize that it's not serving me. You know, I'm serving it when I'm on social media. Uh, it serves me a little bit, but I'm serving it a lot, and it's, it's, it's not where I want to spend my time and attention. Well, although that's, that's the more the reason for my excitement and my gratitude for you actually sharing your pearls of wisdom today with us. Actually, yeah, yeah, and we today. we uh, did a, a bunch of consulting and help with the movie The Social Dilemma, uh, which is Tristan Harris's film, and really takes a really deep look. I think everybody should see it if they haven't. Um, yeah, about um, yeah, it's on Netflix about sort of how these business models work and how we are being uh, exploited by them. So yes, I am trying. There's so much great content out there that it is hard not to like, you know, when I walk my dog, throw a podcast in, but I, I do find when I leave the headphones behind and I put the phone down and just go for, for that quiet walk, I'm, I'm doing that kind of dreaming that takes me to the next level. Thank you very much, Jonah, for a lot of your uh, ideas here. Uh, I think, you know, I'm going to quote Andy Warhol who said, the idea is not to live forever, but to leave ideas that will. That's one important aspect of understanding what ultimately does this idea serve, you know, in our creativity and whom does it serve. And uh, I'm, I'm just inspired by your understanding of social responsibility and your advocacy for it. I really look forward to your next book or let, let us know when, when we can invite you to All Out Coach or have another conversation like this, Jonah. Thanks, Tim. I really appreciate it. Sure. And, and feel free to share yeah. anything else you'd like with, uh, with or any parting thoughts. Um, well, just to go back to something that, that you had said that I, that I was going to jump in on. Um, it's not a very real closing thought, but it's just a thought that, that came up. Um, you mentioned this kind of contradictory advice that we tend to get, you know, like yes. uh, say no, you know, or say yes, or, uh, you know, don't to go into your areas of expertise or never go into your area of expertise or whatever it might be. Um, I think that we, the way to process the endless advice and, you know, memes that we're confronted with and, you know, that the, the self-help that we get um, is to recognize that any piece of advice uh, is a ten, is, it has value and is a trap at the same time. There's a reason that there are contradictory advice out there because Whenever you take a lesson and repeat it a hundred times in your life and live it out a hundred times in your life, you are uh, creating rules for yourself that will outlive their usefulness and become sort of safety mechanisms. So, you know, if, if you've been living by the motto, you know, never say no, uh, it's a yes to everything. See what happens <laughs> when you when you do say no, and if you're coming from the see what happens on the other side, you know. And if you're totally bought into like you know the the vulnerability craze, and you're 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 always being vulnerable, we'll see what it feels like to 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 not be vulnerable in a situation. Um, any piece of advice taken to the extreme is always going to lead you into the safe thinking cycle, essentially. And so there's a there's a good reason to sort of listen to the listen to the experts out there, take it all in and to live a varied life with unexpected moments of, of discovery. I thank you very much for your time. I wish you a lot of luck. Thanks, Jonah. Thank Jonah you. Sachs, everyone. Great. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.